Hello, Rim of the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon are growing all over the world. This is episode number 426. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hello, everybody. What a beautiful day outside. The sun's shining, and yesterday we had some snow, and I know that's moving up to the northeast, and so we're praying for everybody in, in that area that's supposed to get some heavy snow and praying that your electricity stays on and and uh, that you're able to stay safe during this time. I know I prayed for Mike Spaulding this morning. Him and I were supposed to do a Kingdom War Room this uh, or yesterday afternoon. Or I prayed for him yesterday, and they ended up having to go to Pennsylvania. So as this was moving up toward Pennsylvania, I think they were driving out in it. So I was praying for them mm-hmm. and that God would take them up there. They would accomplish what they need to do and uh, come back home. We'll be recording the next Kingdom War Room on Thursday. Well, God's so faithful. Um, and thank God we made it through the, the Super Bowl without uh, any big interference. I was a little bit concerned about that as that was coming up just because that's such a massive gathering. And since we've got um, so many people, you know, that have come over the border that that would love to do some harm. So I'm so thankful that God yeah. protected that. And, and, I've uh, not, and I've not seen such a uh, massive amount of show of force. I mean, between the police and they actually brought out the National Guard uh-huh. were also doing that. I mean, that was – so I wondered if they had some intel that they were going to try something. And, I mean, it's uh, – you know, it was it was almost like the president was coming to town. That kind mm-hmm. of massive force that was in place, which is good. I'm, I want them to be vigilant. Uh huh. And so that so that was good. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm always praying over the Super Bowl anyway because usually they have a halftime that's just full of debauchery and a bunch of satanic stuff. And um, I, I saw some posts on some of the things that went on, but I I don't think it was had near the the punch that some of the other ones that I've seen have had as far as, I mean, you know, that one years ago with Madonna in it, if there was ever a a pagan ritual performed. And so, but I'm still praying over that, asking God to forgive any sins that were connected to that. I ask God to, um, you know, to shield people that watch that because I know there's so much with the broadcast. Um, And, uh, you know, they had the shooting at Joel Osteen's church. And um, thank God, no yeah. more people that were, I don't think any of the people there got hurt. I think the woman was killed that did uh, the they had, shooting. They and had two and, off-duty cops. And I think they there. said she used her son as a shield. And I thought, oh, what a horrid, horrid thing. That's, that's like my, what they do in the occult. My hat's off to those off-duty police officers because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with pistols, they went up against somebody with an AR-15 and didn't back down for a second. Yeah, And so they... Uh, they were doing their due diligence mm-hmm. and their duty for sure. And I, I saw some posts <clears throat> that people were saying that this was a transgender person, but that didn't make sense to me because if there was ever a church that would welcome somebody that's transgender, it would be Joel's church. And the way they and cut, so I, I she, could, with her having a son, I, I doubt that that she was transgender. I mean that I, that didn't make sense to me. I don't know if that's what's going to come out or not, but um, we're definitely in some challenging times, guys. But uh, at the same time, God's raising up His people. Yes, you know there was there's a prophecy out there that I've heard several people talking about that when the Chiefs started winning the the Super Bowl, that supposedly Apostolic Chiefs in the Body of Christ are going to be raising up. Well, that would be a great thing if that happened, <laughs> you know, because we need that. We need um, anointed leaders during this time because there's. Um, I don't think a lot of people even went back to church after after COVID. I know that um, a lot of churches lost a lot of people, and so there's got to be a place that's that's teaching truth, you know, so because you can't get grounded yeah. without the truth. And I, we uh, we watched a video this weekend of a a guy up in the Bronx that I really like, and I mean, uh, he's Hispanic, and I mean, he preaches like he's from the Bronx, and and he called him out and said, listen. Uh, you know, you, you got out of going to church because of the pandemic. If you're not going now, it's just because you don't want to go and you can't get the same thing you can off television. And uh, I think that all of this was set up. There, there were things like during World War II. One of the goals in World War II was to strip Christianity from Europe. And my goodness, hasn't it done that? I mean, the few 
Uh, I, I get emails all the time from Europe saying we can't even find anybody, any churches that, that preach the truth anymore. In fact, in a lot of nations, like in the United Kingdom, many of the churches have been converted to mosques, uh, which, which should alarm you know anybody. I mean, it's just showing the, the reduction of, of, of the influence of, of Protestantism in those nations. And I think part of the pandemic was to reduce the strength of the body of Christ. And my hat is off to, I mean, there are, there are some major ministries, especially out in California, that refused to shut down. And uh, John MacArthur, and I mean, him and his church, they, they actually took the city to court and won. And so the, the Democrats, being such wonderful losers as they are, said, okay, but 80% of your parking space you lease from us, and we're not going to let you park there anymore. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, so there, there, was, there was a direct attack because they, liberals do not consider Church now, liquors, you know, liquor and and all this other stuff, and even nightclubs, they considered essential, but the church was not. And to me, the church is is not only cent- is not only essential; it's central to the strength mm-hmm. of any nation. Well, and that shows. I mean, look at how the decline in our nation. Yeah. Since uh, they've declared that we're not a Christian nation anymore. But anyway, we made it through that. I did a, a I was watching some uh, things online about the April 8th eclipse. It's going to be a total solar eclipse. So it'll be the last total solar eclipse visible from the uh, United States until 2044. And so I was I was kind of watching that and uh, on the the regular Jewish calendar, I know a lot of people follow different calendars, but on the regular Jewish calendars, that is the um, first of the year. That's the first day of the first month. Um, that happens on that uh, that evening, and so I was was looking at some different clips, and it said that uh, there are eight cities named Nineveh on the path of this eclipse. <laughs> I thought we'll talk about a spiritual. Warning. Well, and there one of them's in Nineveh, Missouri. I never even heard of that before. It's up north. Um, that it says, according to Wikipedia, it was named by German settlers after the Nineveh in the Bible. And I thought, why, why? in the world would you name a city after Nineveh? That's like, you know, that's like naming a city maybe, Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe they were talking about because Nineveh repented after Jonah came, but then later it was destroyed. Yeah, it was, because they, they went back to their old ways. So I, I sure wouldn't have named it that, but um, it, it kind of makes you wonder, because there are supposed to be signs in the heavens in the end times, and it makes you wonder if that passing through that... Um, is you know it could be one of two things, it could be this a sign of God's judgment, because of of uh, Nineveh was eventually judged, or it could be a sign that we're uh, we have definitely got all the things going on Nineveh did, and um, we are going to repent. I mean, I've sure been praying for that that there would be a cry of repentance across this land. I think that that's key to taking the nation back, which is what I believe God told me was going to happen many years ago. But I have been so concerned because I've seen such a lack of repentance. Now, there's there's groups of, of people that are praying prayers of repentance. I'm not saying that's not going on. But in um, if you compare that to the huge amount of people that are in such debauchery with no signs of repentance, no signs of acknowledging Almighty God, yeah. or have a fear of the Lord. And so my thought all along is there's no telling what we're going to see to shake us to that place. And so um, in, in my book, everything we get through and there's not major disasters, that's a win. You know, this this Super Bowl, um, I believe that's the prayers of the people that have stopped a huge calamity. From, from being done there because these these people are sitting back calculating the ones that want to destroy the US they will they will calculate for what will bring the the most massive destruction and terror mm-hmm. and you know what well, I, I think that uh, 2024 is going to be a, a very prophetic year in that uh, there there are several scriptures that's going on over in my head one of them you know God said you know basically, uh, you're not really seeking me, but I'm going to make you seek me and, and because of the sake of my great name. And what I keep on seeing in, in, this, in the Spirit is so many believers, instead of dealing with issues, and God has given them grace, he's had them you know, messages and people bring them things, it's like you know they're just going to kick the can down the road. Mm-hmm. 
Well, whenever we have a prophetic time like this, that can goes and it hits a wall and it begins coming back at you. But when it comes, you know, you may have kicked a little can, look like a little tuna can down the road, but given enough time and it hits that wall and it comes back, it's about the size of a 50-gallon barrel that's getting ready to hit a lot of folks that still can be stopped if they would just get right with God. Mm -hmm. And and there are a lot of people saying that they believe that, that a huge revival's going on. And boy, <clears throat> I get behind that. I pray that God does that. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about this last week and kind of prompted part of the, the podcast today is um, I, I get a lot of emails from all over and um, a lot of people are trying to figure out, you know, what's what's going on? What's, what's going on in my family? What's this and that? And it reminded me back of when I first um, was getting healed. And, you know, I had that time to learn the Word and the strategic parts of the Word that I had to learn to fight my way out because I didn't know all of what had happened to me. But, you know, when... Um, as I was getting healed, I've told you before, I, I started being able to see parts of my programming. And so the way it kind of unwinds in your mind is, is it, you'll just um, sense that there's something connected to, to something. Especially they used, they used so many scriptures in programming because they wanted to do the most damage that you could do, and they wanted people to get so... Um, away from the truth of God's word, and that truth be so defiled to them, like like the scripture so defiled that they can't even find it. And uh, I remember thinking, "Oh my word!" You know, because I knew I was in a vulnerable state, um, because I was behind most people on learning the word. I knew that if there was any way that that the enemy could deceive me, he would. If there was any way he could set a trap for me to pull in fall in he would and uh, I, I was so glad that I could what I what I started doing is I, I would read the scripture and as I'd read the scripture because they use scriptures to put in the programming mm -hmm. so as I was reading the whole Bible and going back and studying and things I would especially like in Revelation I noticed as I read that it was like um, it was like you you were in Revelation that's the only way I know how to describe it it's like like you would see yourself in there because they program you um, like they put all of the seals of Revelation in there. And, and in programming, it's meant that when, when a seal's broken, that if they break that seal, like, like sometimes you're supposed to commit suicide, sometimes you're supposed, and there, there's commands with it. And I remember th as you go through each, like the story about um, the woman that represents the, the church, and then there's the story of the, the woman on the, the beach, you know, the, and, and so many things like that. And it's like it's built into. You can almost see, see yourself built into that. And so uh, I was so thankful that, um, you know, I was praying so much to override that. But, you know, if a person didn't know they were programmed, Mike, you could get so far yeah. from the truth and get off on some, some error and then, see, that's what Satan wants you to do. If you can get an error, then that's a door he can hit you with. Oh, absolutely. And I remember back when we first started dealing with this stuff way back in the 90s, we began to discover that they, their, their primary source they used was the King James Bible, and mm. that sometimes they would use the rhythm of it and different things. And so I would— And the numbers. And the numbers. And, as a code. Yeah. And, uh, guys, you know, the, the, the words in the Bible are anointed. The addresses are not. That wasn't even added mm -hmm. until— right about the King James time, and there's actually evidence that it was Sir Francis Bacon and his Mary Band of Occultists that came up with the address system for the King James. Uh, King James was also a Mason. But <clears throat> I would uh, begin preaching out of the New King James or other versions mm -hmm. to break that. And in fact, this year I'm yeah, reading... Yeah, that's, that's how it helped break it with me, because it wasn't in that original scri scripture. Yeah, it wasn't in that original, original rhythm. rhythm. Yeah. And this year I'm reading through the ESV, the English Standard Version. I'm really enjoying it. And one of the things I, I enjoy about doing that, if I see anything that's different, let's say from the King James and New King James, then that triggers me to go back and look at the original Greek or Hebrew to see why it was translated and differently. And that's key. Don't and, you believe that's yeah, key? And, and because key. there are differences in the versions. Yeah, there are. Uh, but there was there was great truth in the New King James that I was was using. And just just reading it in modern-day English, 
helped break that programming down in me. And I've, I've recommended that to some people, you know, that that, that helps because that it takes – and the numbers, that's why, <clears throat> you know, God can use anything. I'm not saying that. But there's been such a mind control effort even over the masses that it worries me when somebody just focuses in on numbers, 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 you know, and it's this group of numbers and this group of numbers because um, I just – I just don't think that that that's the way God no. moves usually. No, there, no, when you're reading scripture, sometimes you can see in the context of it that God will reveal things like, why were there 12 apostles? Right. Okay, that's, specific, that's divine government. Specific numbers. But not, at, not in the world at large. He, he uses his word to, uh, I, I think we have become, there are signs and wonders like this eclipse and things like that that God can use to get our attention, especially when, uh, in the in the original language in, in the book of Genesis has said that he get, it's not seasons it's time you know days and times and and the moadim that that's how we find out when the feast of the Lord are going to be but God primarily speaks to us by His Holy Spirit through His mm-hmm. Word first and anytime we start looking to other things other than the written Word of God. I mean, we we can we can set ourselves up to be going down a rabbit trail that that God had nothing to do with. Well, and I can give you something to just consider. It's just something I've thought about. Uh, I have no way of proving this or anything else, but I I do know absolutely that numbers were in my programming as triggers, like time time on the clock. I would I've told you before I'd wake up at the. Two twenty-two, three thirty-three. And, and I remember years ago, you had an internal clock. You wouldn't even have to look at the clock. No, you I could, did. I mean, down to the, and it was accurate to the minute. And I also was, had a, a calculator <laughs> that the, I could just stand there and almost get within just a little bit of what what yeah. our groceries were going to cost. And the only the only difference in the variance most of the time, as far as I could tell, because I mean, I began testing this years ago, was you know you go into different places and there'll be a different amount of tax on a sales tax, and the the, the variance would have been the difference in the sales tax. But because well, you were even trying to calculate the sales tax, and in it, it. you know those were things I was praying over because I thought I don't think this is normal. I don't think, that, um, but. What what I determined, and this is just my opinion, I can't back this up, people that know more about scientific things and computers and things would be able to determine this um, more, but you, you know how everybody's saying, like, these numbers are something from God. Like, if you see 1111, that means something from God. If you see, and um, my, my opinion is this, I, they know that our brain is like a computer. I think they learned from uh, what the experiments that they've done for decades on mind control victims. I think they learned exactly what they could do even through um, broadcasts yeah. over the masses of the people. Now, when you when you get online, you'll find out not, it's not just Christians seeing these groups of numbers. It's, it's unsaved everybody. people. Yeah. And so now why would God sh- show unsaved people something and they wouldn't even have a reference to know what it meant? Well, I think it's part of the subliminal programming. You know, you can put stuff in the background of you can be watching your favorite show. Mm -hmm. They can put stuff in the background that your conscious mind will not perceive, but your your unconscious mind is receiving and putting in that programming. Well, and let's just say that there is something. If you watch the movie The Matrix and how they had that that series running down the screen, let's say that our minds can be uh, set up like a grid, like like uh, zero to nine in different variations of that, and let's say that that they have found out how to project commands based on numeric codes. Yeah, that will be perceived in in your brain, and then then without you knowing it, in the subliminal, you are corresponding to that and not even knowing what's going on. I think that's why they can cause like riots if they want to and different things because they can move on those on codes that are there. Now, you'd say, well, why um, why would you see the codes? This is just my opinion. I believe that God has loosed an anointing against the mind control. I believe when you uh, see those numbers, it's because your brain has blocked the code. It didn't go beyond that block, and so your consciousness perceives the code. Yeah. And, and so let's say that um, 
you know, now they put the triggers out there for the mind control victims. They're on signs, they're everywhere. Like you'll see uh, something that costs two twenty two and or eleven eleven. You'll see all kinds of things that are set there. And I think what happens is your mind is trying to look for what what this means. Your mind is trying to to uh, figure out what what is this? What is this that I'm perceiving? Because God's blocking it, so your mind sees the code. Yeah. And so that's why, like, you'll see it on a license plate because your mind's looking for it. What is this? You'll, you'll see it on a, a price. That's, that's the only thing I can come up with that makes any sense. I do not, but God can show somebody through numbers. I'm, I'm not saying that, but there's such but a massive a amount thing. of it that, that for, to believe that this is just God showing, um, you know, everybody a certain thing. I just don't believe that. And yeah, I think yeah. that, I, th- I think it's a good thing. If yeah. you see numbers, to me, your your mind is blocking any commands coming in yeah. because it, it would be on some kind of a, a coded grid that they've found out to use. You know, and an old school version of this was the subliminal stuff. I remember one time we went to the, and it was a drive-in, and, you know, between movies they have, you know, let's go out to the movies, and they have the popcorn dancing and all that. They had messed up on the subliminal where they slowed down instead of speeding it up. And all of a sudden, it flashes on the on the screen. Eat more now. Eat more popcorn. Eat more popcorn now. I remember it was a black screen with white letters. And but it normally, you know, when they're when they're, when they're doing it sixty frames per second, that would be so quick that you you consciously wouldn't perceive it. But I mean, you could you could. I'm thinking back on that. I'm thinking, okay, this was like about a minute into the into the little thing, and it's like you can see everybody get out of their cars then and head to go get popcorn. Well, they were and, testing, and, and, that, and that was old school. They were testing the commands, and I, they've been doing this for many, many years. And, and there's many levels of it. They do it on the emotive level, where they're just constantly manipulating your emotions. That's why sitcoms are the way they are. They have used it to to transform society. It's, it's called social engineering. Uh, they have been look at what they, they they have taken us to leave it to Beaver to Modern Family. And it has all been done through the programming on television and movies. And I mean, somebody that knows more about how the brain operates and, uh, you know, how how they could have done that with a numerical system would be able to uh, give a better opinion than me. But but that's the only thing I can come up with that makes any sense. I know I know for a fact that popcorn was one of the triggers, and it was not uncommon to come across people that if they're triggered. Yeah. They'll they'll rub somebody's feet, and that person's eating popcorn. Yeah, and there's a big thing about feet and all this and rubbing feet, and so it's um, and it's I, just things you pick up as you go through all these things. And uh, I can't tell you why. I know that um, Satan is, um, or may or maybe it's whatever was in the garden that that the serpent that lost its its legs. It is obsessed with feet and women having skinny ankles. There's another thing you pick up. Now, can I say what all these things are or why? That? No, I can't. No. But, I mean, you see enough of this over almost 30 years, and, and you can draw some conclusions. But I think that we have to be very careful about um, a series of numbers and things like that. I, I think that it, we should know that God can stop anything, and there's been so much prayer over mind control uh, I think he is blocking things. He is. Uh, and I don't think we realize just how, how complex the brain is. Uh, there was an um, episode in Through the Wormhole that they have Morgan Freeman narrating uh, in the first season, and they have discovered that there are elements of the mind that are a quantum computer and that there are places in the mind. You know, norm, normally you have to have neural pathways and synaptic, and you know, the women have more... Uh, synaptic connections between the two hemispheres than men do, okay? But one of the things they have discovered is there are connections where there are no synaptic connections because there's quantum entanglement between both sides of the brain, which means that the, the, they, the leading theory is that the brain itself, when God made you, your brain is a quantum computer. I believe and that. Because I think, I, think yeah. I think that's because as we get saved, we become quantum entangled with the Spirit of God, and mm-hmm. he begins to put things in. But I, I think they're using that against us, that the, some of the most powerful computers now that we have on the earth are quantum computers like the D-Wave computer and stuff. They're still trying to catch up with what our brain does. That's how intricate God made you. 
and they have been using it against us. That's why the helmet of salvation and renewing our mind to the Word of God is so important Mm -hmm. because it begins building a shield. There, there There is something... In Genesis six, when you hear what when you re, when you read what the, what the the watchers had done in Genesis six, it was more than just creating hybrids called the Nephilim. They had created a network of something that caused men's minds to be continuously evil. That they were in control of their minds, and it was this downward spiral of humanity. And Jesus said, "In the days of Noah, is the way it's going to be in the last days." And so I think everything that you're talking about is them using different methodologies for the same purpose to cause men's hearts to be continually filled with evil because that's even part of what Nimrod did when it talked about him being a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's not what it says in Hebrew. It was he was getting in God's face and he was hunting men and stealing them from God. And Mary, they're doing the same thing with all the things that you're talking about yeah, today. They are, I believe it. And I think I think one of the... Um the things that we, we're going to have to deal with is there's so much out there that can, you know, especially on the Internet, that, if, that would give you an opinion. And if you aren't grounded in the Word, um, it would be so easy to be deceived. And, you know, we've got, um, you got to have the training uh, in how to go back to the Greek and Hebrew to study the Word. But then you also have to have the leading of the Holy Spirit for the moment, because there are some things going on right now. We need uh, the insights from the Holy Spirit to even know how to proceed. And so, but you can't have that and and trust that you're you're getting that without the training in the Word. Well, absolutely, one of the one of the we we always know with the um, with the reformers, they had no sola scriptolis, you know, mm-hmm. Christ alone, Scripture alone. But they had another phrase, testimonium spiritus sancti, which really not only talked about the testifying of the Holy Spirit to Scripture, it painted a picture that you had to be balanced with the Word and with the Spirit. If we had too much Spirit and not enough Word, you ended up in mysticism. Mm -hmm. If you had all Word and no Spirit, you ended up in legalism. And so even in in learning to exegete Scripture, I mean, that's when you really start taking part. And some of it, uh, when you, you get into grammatical structure and syntax and all that, some of that's above my pay grade in the Greek and Hebrew, and I've got to rely on others uh, that that's all they do, but you know you can you can exegete scripture, but if it's not the scripture that God's taking you down, it's like you're spinning your wheels. What connects is when the Holy Spirit says, "I'm going to show you something," and then you use the proper research methodology to ferret out everything that God's wanting to show you. And what what I have seen a lot in what we have seen on the internet is it may be that God kind of set them down a path, but because they lacked the research methodology, they were coming to the wrong conclusions, even though God may have initiated the initial research. Mm-hmm. And, and, and guys, you, you cannot just do your research by watching video after video after video, because there's a lot of crazy stuff out there, guys. Well, and, and you, um, I knew, I talked to Dr. Mack on the phone when we first got married. He'd call you a lot, and he was your mentor. And he had a, a doctor at Princeton. He was retired as a Navy chaplain. And he, he taught you to look at things across the board. Yeah, he did. You know, like when you, like let's say if I was a student right now at the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, they would give me a systematic theology approved by the Assemblies of God. And I would only study Pentecostal systematic theology. What he did is he set me down Burke's systematic theology. He set me down a Arminianistic systematic theology because Burke's is Calvinistic, a Baptist one. And what's interesting in American Baptist is a blending of Calvinism and Arminianism. And then he set me down a Pentecostal one. I had to study all four. And I think later on he added another one, if I can remember right, because it's been a long time ago. And I had to, whenever there was a variance between them, then I had to go back and try to figure out what caused the variance mm-hmm. and, and, re, and to the Word of God. And so I, I was able to see from a lot of different perspectives, and I saw uh, many times Calvinists and Armenianists see the same thing, but they're looking at the same mountain from different angles. A Calvinist will say, you'll make it to the end and be saved because you're elect. Armenians will say, when you make it to the end, it's because you're saved. You, that's that's when you, the proof of your salvation uh, but there's also other extraneous, uh, extraneous things that caused Calvin to go the way that he did. 
But it, it allowed me, when, when I research, and, and Mary will attest to this, I look at it from every angle possible. Mm -hmm. And like when I want to study something, I look at not only the scriptures that kind of confirm my hypothesis, I will examine all the scriptures and the commentaries against my hypothesis. Yeah, that's a good idea. To, to understand the arguments and to try to find a balance. Well, that's the way it is. One, you know, I've, I do so many mundane tasks for the ministry and to, to where, um, you know, a lot of times if I'm cleaning or something like that, I'll just, I can pray. Uh, but if, if I've got to kind of concentrate on something uh, while I'm doing it, I'll just, I'll try to find some videos just so I keep information going in and things to look at. And I, I saw a video um, recently where there's a teacher that um, has some really good videos on, on different things. And it got my attention because he said, uh, when we die, we don't go to heaven. So I wanted to know what he said. And so I watched this, and it, it basically what he's saying is he said we go to Sheol until yeah. Jesus comes back. And, you know, the first thing that pops in your mind when he says that, and, and he addresses it, is, well, but to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And he said that, that the presence of the Lord is in Sheol. In the upper part of Abraham's in the, uh, and And then the second place my brain went to <laughs> was, you know, the scriptures where when Jesus rose from the dead, there were others that rose. Yeah. And I thought, so, okay, for them to rise... They had to have a glorified body. Yes. And so didn't they then they go back to Sheol? That didn't make any sense to me. And so and, I was I was And what's interesting is when he did that teaching, he avoided Matthew twenty seven altogether. And Matthew's the only one that records this. It's not in the other synoptic gospels. And let me let me read this real quick. It's in Matthew twenty seven verses fifty one through fifty six. This is out of the ESV. And it says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were risen, and coming out of their tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Okay, Now, when we look at this, most commentators, and I want to read a couple here. One is Jameson Fawcett Brown, which is the commentary critical and explanatory for the whole Bible, and it's a good, what I call a medium-level commentary. Uh, you have some, like some of the ones I have in my library, they're like $100 a volume, and there's unless the ministry was buying it, we couldn't afford them. But this is a good one for most folks to have. And it says, The graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. These sleeping saints, see 1 Thessalonians 4.14, were Old Testament believers who, according to the usual uh, punctuation in our version, were quickened into resurrection life at the moment of the Lord's death, but lay in their tombs until the resurrection when they came forth. But it's far more natural as we think and cognizant of other scriptures to understand that only the graves were open probably by the earthquake at our Lord's death. And it's only in preparation for the subsequent exit of those who slept in them when the spirit of life should enter into them from their risen Lord, and along with him they came forth, trophies of his victory over the grave. Thus, in the opening of the graves at the moment of the Redeemer's expiring, there was a glorious symbolic proclamation that death, which had just taken up, had swallowed, that had taken place, had swallowed up death in victory. And whereas the saints that slept in them were awakened only by the risen Lord to accompany him out of the tomb, it is fitting that the Prince of Life should be the first that should raise from the dead. And then Dake goes into more detail in the, egg, in the Dake's Annotated Study Bible. It says, Those bodies made part of the multitude of captives, Christ captured from Satan in the underworld of departed spirits, which he took captive with him when he ascended on high, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, and Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Now when Christians die, they no longer go into the lower parts of the earth held captive by the devil against their will, but go to heaven to await the resurrection of the body, 2 Corinthians 5, 18, uh, Philippians 1, 21 through 24, Revelation 6, 9 through 11, and Hebrews 12, 22. The wicked continue to go to hell, waiting their resurrection. And so part of the revelation that we have from Scripture is that when Christ died, he, first of all, he went over to the lower part of Sheol, 
And that's when the devil found out what hell was all about. Mm-hmm. He conquered them. He, he yes, paraded he through hell victorious over all the principalities, powers, show. rules. But then he went over the chasm and he preached the gospel to those that were basically in the bosom of Abraham waiting there with an IOU. When he resurrected, they resurrected with glorified bodies. Now, this also goes perfectly in line with the, with the principle of first fruits offering. Remember when the, when he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, he said, "Don't touch me. I'm getting ready to go to my father." Well, he was he had he was absolutely purified. He's getting ready to take his blood and place it on the altar. And then, what part of the first fruits offering is? You know, the to it, in biblical times when they were when they were in the land, part of the sequence is you have to make sure that the barley harvest is a beeve that it's ready for harvest. Well, they would took the take the first sheaves of it. And on the first on the on the day of first fruits, the high priest would hold up the that initial barley harvest to the Lord, saying, Here is the initial harvest, the rest are coming. And so when Jesus as the high priest stood before the Father after after atoning for man's sins, he stood there with all the saints that were in Sheol that resurrected with him, and he stood there before the Father and said, here's the initial mm-hmm. first fruits, and Daddy, we're going to get the rest. That's it. That's because it. What, when you look at it, the, the barley harvest represented the Jews. The wheat harvest represents the Gentiles. And there are actually two different harvesting seasons. Mm-hmm. And so, Lines up. so it, it so, makes sense. So today, when we die, we're and I, I do not believe in soul sleep, and I, and soul sleep when they could, when they say it's asleep, that is a colloquialism used in that era. Today, we would say they kicked the bucket. If I was in Mexico, they would say he stretched out his legs. I mean, we have different phraseologies cultures mm-hmm. do to 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 make it to where it's not like he died because there, there's such a finale. We, we we try to soften the blow of it. And some have even went to the book of Revelation where you had those that were saints that had been martyred for the gospel during the tribulation period, and they're crying underneath the altar, and God tells them to rest a little bit, and they try to use that for soul sleep. Well, if soul sleep was automatic, how could there be unrest by them crying out for God to do something about it? And the word he used there was not sleep. It was be at peace, just just rest, I'm going to take care of it. And so soul sleep, we, we, we use a phrase that was, that was a colloquialism, and we try to make it into a doctrine when it's not. Paul was very succinct, to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord. Now, one of the things that I, I need to go through, and, and I, I think it was, it was borrowed from my library and not brought back years ago, uh, I began corresponding with Wilford Reddit, who was the son-in-law of John G. Lake. And he had all the unpublished stuff of John G. Lake. And in those was a transcript that, according to their ministry, that he had gotten a document out of, out of Jerusalem at great expense. And it was, you, you have the graves opening and you have the people going into, into Jerusalem. It was the, the rec- there was the records of one family that Uncle Fred or whatever had come back from the dead. And he described what had happened in hell. And he said that there was the Holy One went into the deep parts of hell and there began screaming. And he said there was a great war. Well, that was the devil getting his comeuppance, okay? And then the glorious one came over the chasm and he preached. And it was the resurrected uncle or whatever he was preached the gospel to them that this was Messiah, that this was Almighty God come in the flesh. And he came and he says, I have conquered death, 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 death hell, and the grave. And he said, my, my uncle resurrected with him and began testifying. You want to talk about a sign and wonder that, that you, had, you had relatives that you know you put in a grave maybe a year or two ago. And they're coming knocking on your door saying, this is what Messiah just did in, in, in the upper bosom of, of, of heaven or of, of Sheol. And so there are some records that also testify to that. And I'm, I'm going to start because, I mean, we're in the process of moving stuff over. I had it in mm-hmm. a big three-inch binder, uh, three-ring binder. But there, there were, there were, there's evidence of that. And now this, this isn't something to uh, split hairs as far as fellowship over because, you know, you major in the majors. But I think what it does show is if you do not have the proper research methodology 
that, that you're just looking for scriptures that agree with your hypothesis instead of looking at all of them and weighing out the pros and the cons and stuff, mm-hmm. that it, it's easy to get off in some of the peripheral things in, in theology in the body. I and, believe that. And I, I think, you know, I've been kind of working through my head, you know, do I need to teach a class on research methodology uh, and I, I think what I'm going to start doing over the next few months is I'm going to start building a list of resources that, especially if you're called to ministry, but I mean, just anybody, uh, that you, there are hard copies of books that you need to have. And some of them are, are pretty affordable. Like, and some of them, like some of the ones I want to have for our library, just in case logos goes down one day, they're a little expensive. I mean, mm-hmm. just like the set that we just bought or or the uh, Hebrew and, and, and Aramaic lexicon of the Old Testament. The reason I've not purchased it physically is three volumes of $600 because when you get the, the high academic stuff, they're very expensive. But they're, they're very needed as we begin examining Scripture and we begin examining things. And I think most people, if you just point them in the right direction, say, listen, here's a real good book on basic hermeneutics. Here's a real good book on, on basic research methodology. And once you go through those, then you can begin okay, what kind of budget I have? And, you know, Christian book distributors, Amazon are both really good places, and there's some others that you can get stuff really good prices. And every once in a while, they'll have them on sale. Uh, some of the stuff in my library that was normally pretty expensive, I got for 80% off, okay? So you're getting something that was like $700, and you're getting it for $110. And we're, we, we need to build our own libraries, I agree. And, we, and we need I to agree. do research ourselves. We need to be a faithful brand. And guys, I don't care how uh, great the graphics department is for many ministry. And I, I look at all you need, you've, you've watched me and I said, man, I wish I had people that could do that when I'm looking at some of these videos. Just stunning. Uh, just a lot of them. There's, there's, I mean, they really do great graphics. Well, great graphics does not necessarily mean that you know, it was a great presentation, but it may not be theologically accurate. And, and, and so when we see something like that, anybody needs to have the reference materials in their own biblical library that they can be faithful Bereans. And, you know, guys, when, if, if, you're, if you're watching a series that I'm preaching, don't just swallow it because I'm preaching it. Go do your own research. Mm-hmm. We have to be faithful Bereans that we go and we research it out, and then you become established in it. Yeah, especially teachers. Don't you yes. think that if you're – and I, I honestly think – that everyone has been so suppressed by everything that's gone on for decades that I think there are probably people now just sensing that there's God's calling them to to step forward and meet uh, their destiny that he's always had planned that maybe has been delayed or whatever. I just feel like I feel like this is just going to be such a powerful time for the body of Christ to raise up and... Um, and do what we're supposed to do. And, you know, I don't know how much time we have left, but we need to plan as if it's a long time. We need to plan. And then we're going to be ready for Jesus whenever he comes and be so happy when he comes. But but I that's what I, I think we really need because I see so, so much um, error being taught error. But, you know, people will say that they're, they're getting this from the Holy Spirit. And, I mean, it wouldn't take but just a... A very primitive purview of the scriptures to see it's not right. Absolutely, but because we don't have a foundation, and the Holy Spirit will never tell you anything that doesn't line up with the Word. Now, one of the things that, that I have been saying for a long time, there are there are prophetic uh, temporal echoes. I call them that God repeats the same pattern over and over again for our sake. Before Jesus came the first time, there was a releasing of John the Baptist. And, and he, was, he was actually raised among the Essenes for safety. God took him out of the way until the time of releasing. And he came in the spirit of Elijah. And there's also some real neat uh, studies that you can do that uh, one, one time I was at a colloquium sitting with one of the leading authorities in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he shared, well, he said, you know, the Essenes had the, the uh, mantle of Elijah. And so when he came, you actually, if you read the scripture, it was camel's hair. It matches, well, it was actually Elijah's. That before Messiah ever comes, there's always a releasing of the anointing of Elijah. Now, that anointing of Elijah, its primary focus, Elijah called and he, he was preaching baptism of repentance. It wasn't just uh, you know getting wet. It was 
to fully repent because that's what makes straight the paths of the Lord Mm -hmm. is that repentance. And I think, Mary, there are tens of thousands of John the Baptist that are on the backside of the desert right now that God has hidden that he's getting ready to release. Oh, I believe and that. And what, what I want to see is that they have the, the theological tools necessary that they give a true word in season. My part is I want to see everybody delivered. Yes. Um, because there's just been so many sneaky ways that the enemies tried to oppress us, and, and um, I, I think that we can all be free. And, you know, one of the things that I wanted to say before you end in, in prayer is uh, God's been showing me a lot of things, studies and things about how uh, detrimental stress is. And yes. if there's ever a time when people are going to feel stress, it is right now because there's so much in limbo even about our nation. There's so much in limbo about wars and uh, rumors of wars, everything and that's it. going on. I mean, stress is it's just almost a way of life for some people. And, and I just wanted to share some things that, that I know God helped me with in those early days because I was under such stress <laughs> when, when the occult came after us and I was trying to figure out what in the world's going on and why is this person acting like this. And it was just so stressful. I mean, there were, there were nights I couldn't sleep. And, uh, it, I mean, it takes a toll on your body. And I remember one time that I was, um, it seems like if I could get outside, uh, especially like, like if I just, just walked outside and just in the grass. And Now, there's some New Age stuff that talks about when you, vibrations and stuff when you, when you get outside, and they'll put New Age twists on that. But I honestly think that there, there is the frequency that God put in His creation that when we do just get outside, sit on the ground, um, I, I think that it can help us. Yeah, it can. I think it can, you know, give us stability with all of the the things being broadcast at us. I remember one time God told me that there that he he designed trees to where when the wind would blow through them that there that it would affect the the atmosphere and bring peace. Um, and so I I've recently, you know, because there's been more stress, I get stressed um, when I hear people in distress. I just can't help it. I wish I was one of those people that could just set things aside. But if I feel like somebody's in distress, I I will just be um, will be prone to being stressed out all the time till I see it rectified. I guess that's just how God made me. But I but all along I've I've known that stress has had a very big impact on my health, and so you know recently uh, we got this a new dog in the last year and. And she loves to, we got a back room where she can get up and just look out the window. And she watches the bunnies and she watches the squirrels. You can tell if she sees a deer, she really goes goes to town on that. But uh, Mike put up a a bird feeder so that she could watch the birds. And I found out how much I liked it. I've kind of always liked watching birds when I'd get outside. Um, And so Steph, (laughs) I told her, I said, Steph, I said, this is pitiful to be this old and I don't know the names of all these birds. So her and the boys got me this little... Um, book that tells you the the birds that are here in the Ozarks, and that was so sweet. And and so I've just really found like if I can just get to nature, um, you know, going going out and and taking some time and just going fishing. If you like to fish, sitting on a on a bank and fishing, uh, that can do it. I think that um, you know just just making sure that you got comfortable things. You know, when we get <laughs> When we get home, it's go to sweatpants, baby. I mean, that's just, that's right. I've always told Mike. I look forward to it. <laughs> the most comfortable thing in the world to me is a worn-out T-shirt. <laughs> and there's this, you know, fine line from where it goes from a worn-out T-shirt that is so soft, it's better than silk to me, to where it becomes, you you call it Ozark, Ozark Lace because it's starting getting holes in it. <laughs> then it becomes a dust ring. But, but anything that you can think of like that, like if you're, a lot of times you'll feel stressed and you don't even know it. Like sometimes... I will. I won't even realize I'm stressed, except I realize if if I just kind of relax, you know, my my jaws aren't tense, and my and I don't realize how much stress I'm in, and and so that's one of the things. On top of you know their their 
trying to get us with food. They're trying to get us with fluoride. They're trying to get us with all these things. Well, they're also making stressful situations. And we're in one of the most stressful times, Mm -hmm. I remember, just as a whole. And so if you can just do things, make yourself comfortable. You know, get get something you like to drink, a warm drink, and just sit and just just look out the window. Get outside if you can, and and maybe just sit on the ground. And and there's a scientific reason for that. You know, if you've ever traveled, and I, I can't remember which one it is, if it's 60 hertz here in America and 50 over in, in Europe or, or vice versa. Uh, when Europe was looking at that as they were uh, beginning to adapt to AC current, they found out that the the current, the frequency that America chose was agitating to the nervous system. Mm. And so all the electricity, imagine all the wires running through your house and your building, and they're resonating at that hertz, agitates your nervous system now over in Europe, you don't have that because they, they change the frequency. That's why you have to have adapters and stuff when you go over to, let's say, England or whatever. That's why getting out of the house and getting away from all that stuff yeah. also helps calm the nerves and everything because um, agitated people, number one, they're easy to rile up when you want them to. But a lot of times you, 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 you're under that stress for so long that your 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 adrenals are tweaked and everything else, and you start missing things. Uh, you you don't have the same mental acuity oh, I believe that you that. would normally have, and so the next thing you know, you're not connecting the dots on the news and everything else because we need to remember that the federal government works for us, not vice versa. They're supposed to represent us, not even the big corporations, but we we've got to hold them to task, and we do that by voting and making our voice heard. But if they can pull one over on us, where they're constantly manipulating us, and keep us under stress, then they get us to where we're in survival mode. And you miss you you, you, you ever seen anybody in, in survival mode? They kind of get tunnel vision. Mm-hmm. They they try to keep us constantly in that. And I think one of the reasons they hate true Christianity is I'm of another kingdom, and when I get with God, He doesn't call me to have His tunnel vision. He opens up my yeah. perception. He expands our borders. And that's yes. that's another thing is, you know, anytime we're sitting and praying and communing with God, that that creates an atmosphere. And I've, I've felt like God's telling me here lately, send it out. Yes. Don't, don't just keep it where you are. Send it out. And when yes. you go out in the streets and the byways, send it out and say, Father, I just ask you to expand your kingdom. Let the anointing flow. Let devils flee. And I think that that's so important. Um but it's it's try it they're trying to just get our minds set in a certain pattern and and it's going to take some effort on our part to to get to that place where we can have the peace of god because stress takes away the peace and they're yes. just they're they're just bringing stuff on the news over and over and over and you just think oh my goodness you know they they have so many uh, people that get shot in Springfield, Missouri anymore. You keep extra prayer when you're up there saying, Father, put shields up that stray bullets are not. I mean, they, they have they that only all the repeat, time. They, don't, they only even make a, make available to the public a tenth maybe of what really goes on up there. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, people don't know to guard their minds. So you've got mind control frequencies going all the time, and you hear more and more crazy things going on. So so it would be real easy to just get stressed out and not be able to focus and do things. But But know this. God is so great. He could change something in a minute. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? He could change something in a minute. And I think our prayers do more than we could ever even imagine. Because we're going before the Father and saying, Father, you see what the the evil's doing. And and we just just start, you know, standing in that gap. Yeah. I think it it makes a huge difference. You know, when I when I read the Genesis account of Noah, it gives me hope. He was in a world that was plunged into darkness. And yet he was able to stay pure before God, even with all the watcher technology and everything going on. We read the book of Revelation. There are those that come out of great tribulation with their robes dressed in white. It means, you know what that means to me? No matter all the junk they pull, Mary, that there are spiritual applications in the kingdom that overcomes all of it. And what we're trying to get to is the proper spiritual applications that we can be in the world but not of the world. And, and to learn how to flow in the kingdom when we do, Nothing the Antichrist system can do will capture our minds or, or capture our, our, our affections because we're walking in a different kingdom. That, mm-hmm. that if, if you will, kingdom technology trumps watcher technology. That's right. And the, and the more we can pull ourselves out of the Babylonian system, the more yes. that we can, you know, there's some things we can't change. We can't change that we have 
currency, and there's all kinds of horrible occult symbols on it. Uh, for right now, we, we can't do anything about that, but we sure can plead the blood of Jesus over any finances that we do have to, to you know, I plead the blood of Jesus every time we pay taxes. And I say, now, Father, I, I commit this taxes we're paying so that there will be godly laws established. I pray over all that because we, we just don't realize how much authority we have. Yes. And what they want you to do is, is think that that's not, that's not possible. And I, See, I think everything that goes on, and I, I want to end with this if we can, I think what they do is they, they try to for emotionally, psychologically, theologically to get us out of line with heaven. Because the more out of line we are, the, ne- the less we can connect in authority to move. The more that we are aligned to Jesus, the more that we are aligned to the commandments, the more that we are aligned to the kingdom, it's like having, having a, a, con- a high-voltage connection that when, when it's properly grounded and connected, you can flow full force. I, I, uh, I had an email this weekend where somebody was asking me about things in the garden, and, and, and the answer, what, what fared it out, was Adam and Eve, they were, the, they were walking tabernacles. They were priests. They were mobile tabernacles in complete submission to the Creator. That is what allowed them to move in authority and take dominion. Mm-hmm. When I realized that I am a priesthood and that I'm also a mobile tabernacle, that all the instruments of worship that we see in the tabernacle of Moses is in us, and we're using them in our worship to God, whether it's uh, burning the flesh on the on the brazen altar or fellowshipping with Him in, in the holy place or the holy of holies. As, as we're moving through all that and we're, and we're functioning in that priesthood, that's what causes us to so connect with Jesus that I, because I am a man under authority, completely properly under authority, I can move in authority. And that's why God, I think that that's because they have got us so out of alignment, we get little sparks of authority every once in a while. Uh-huh. When God is saying, guys, come on, I, I want to hook you up to 220. I want, I want you to see Book of Acts kind of stuff. Well, now come right. on in and line up. That's right. And, and so what we need to ask God to do is realign us. And anything that the world or its system, Father, has taken us out of alignment with Jesus. And God, let me tell you something, guys, and all you Hebrew people. When you're in line with Jesus, Moses is in alignment with Jesus because Jesus is the cornerstone, not Moses. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the cornerstone, and when you line up properly with him, you're lined up with Moses. And what the Protestant church has done is we have created a Jesus that's not in alignment with Moses, and that was on purpose. Yeah, it was. It all lines together. And when I align to him, and I am submitted to him, and he he is the creator come in the flesh. He is almighty God. Mm Mm-hmm. And when I line up with him, he's my king. I live for my king. I die for my king. That's I right. obey my king. Anything in my life that doesn't line up with my king, I crucify. Mm-hmm. That, that's, the, that's the Christian task. The more that I do that, the more that he can do signs and wonders and moving in authority in me. And guys, that, that, that is the whole purpose of the priesthood is to bring us in line that when we fall before the Holy of Holies, in the Holy of Holies, before the mercy seat, the throne of God, that we're lined up so with that throne that when we exit it, we're like Moses, that our faces glow with his presence. That's what God wants for mm-hmm. all of us, not just, not just for a select few. I want us to be so many of us, the devil doesn't know what to do. Well, and you know, it's like I've said before, God wants that. We don't yes. have any doubt he wants that. He has been so loving to us, though, in whatever condition we were in. If we would have, have flowed in that kind of power and we didn't have doors covered and, and things in our lives that Satan could attack, we could us. have got destroyed. Yes. And so he's waiting for this, for this group of people, this remnant, to raise up and say, you know what? I don't care what in the world I need to repent of. I am not going to let a spirit be a part of me. I am not going to let the kingdom of darkness have an inroad into me. Let's take it because sometimes we have repentance and lip service. I'm going to repent and I'm going to redo anything in my life to line it up with the Word. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And that takes some work. Yeah, because that's hopefully not as much work as I've had to do and am continuing to do. But because that that, that but represents one of the Hebrew words for repentance, which is shub, which means to return back to the uh-huh. ways of God. That's right. Get me lined up, Father. And and trying to find out what have we been taught that's not the ways of yes, God. Yes, absolutely. But God has a plan, and we are praying for you guys. We love you so much. I know that you're in our prayers, and yes. and I, maybe that's just 
that's just the love in me that, that I can't lay things down when others are in distress, but know that it, it prompts me to cry out to God in your behalf. And Father, we not only release comfort to your people, and yes. in, the, in the Hebrew word shalom, which yes. is a full manifestation of the kingdom. Bring peace. Father. But Father, you taught your priesthood to speak over your people, be strong, be strong, be strengthened. Yes. And Father, we ask that you would make us strong in whatever situation we're in, that you would give us the grace to realign ourselves completely with the kingdom of God and our King Jesus so that your power can flow through us unhindered, Father, not for our sake, but for the sake of his great name and for the sake of those that are still caught in darkness. Father, let them see a great light. Let them see you in us and let let them touch the kingdom of God and be converted, we ask in Jesus' name. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.